Okay, let's get going here. Uh, so project number two is due at noon on Thursday. Uh, thank you for those of you who've already turned yours in early. Uh, please note that uh, I will be in meetings pretty much all day on Thursday. So if you had any last-minute questions regarding the project on Thursday, I will not be available to answer them, unfortunately. Are there any questions before we begin today? Okay. So, left off last time on about page uh, 61 in the notes. I'm actually going to jump ahead to 62, then come back to page 61. And we were talking about K means clustering, where K is the number of clusters that we have to uh, pre-specify um, before we even do the algorithm itself. And um, so the purpose of this little subsection then talks about, well, how, how, do we, how can we choose K? Um, and there is one numerical way that's available to you to help you choose the value for K. And that's to compute this uh, numerical value that I call W here, which is the within sums of squares divided by the total sums of squares. What does that mean? Well, we've already talked about the within sum of squares in the notes. If I were to put the mathematical value here, it's simply you sum over all the uh, clusters, sum over all the observations, and then sum over all the variables, and then calculate for the rth observation, ith variable in the kth cluster. Calculate that x, or specify that x, I should say, and subtract off then the mean value for variable i in cluster k. Square it. So this is a sum of squares. Within the clusters, this is a sum of squares. So this was defined earlier in the notes. Now, would you prefer a small within sums of squares or a large within sums of squares? Small. And let's take a look at an intuitive reason why, just to make sure it's clear. Let's say simply we have two variables, x1 and x2. And here's my cluster that I'm forming. And let's say they have the choice between two observations to including the cluster, the purple one or the blue one. In which case, the purple or the blue is going to have the lower within sums of squares? The purple one, because it's closer to the essentially the center. And since we're doing k means cluster, we're defining the center by the mean. So that's why we want to have a small within sums of squares. So in other words, you can think of it this way, that the smaller the within sums of squares is, the better, um, the, better the clustering is. The better the choice of K is. Now there is a problem though, and that is as K increases, this within sums of squares is always going to go down. And for an intuitive reason why, think of the extreme case where k is equal to the number of observations you have. Well, in that case, k would, I'm sorry, in that case, the within sum squares would be zero. Okay? So, and we'll look at shortly then, well, how do we deal with the fact that this within sum of squares always decreases? Let's get back here to the notes. Okay. So now, the total sums of squares. It basically is a sum of squares, but now assuming that we're not even doing clustering at all. So it's exactly the same formula but it's one small difference. Notice in this mean here we don't take into account the cluster. So essentially what we're doing is we're looking at how close is each observation to the overall mean for that variable. 
for the corresponding variable. So then, would you prefer w to be small or large? Small. Small. Yeah, smaller it is. Essentially, according to this numerical this numerical measure, the better the clustering is. Now, let's say if you had a w for, uh, you calculate a w when k was equal to 4, and you had a w that, uh, for k equal 5. Is this denominator going to change at all? No. no. So in essence, we could just simply look at the numerator only. Uh, but you will often see people look at this, essentially, this ratio. This is a number that's always going to be between 0 and 1. And make a decision from that. But I just at least wanted to point out that the denominator here is not, not necessary, but typically people will still include it. Um, now this then leads then to uh, what R gives in its output uh, from using the k-means clustering um, algorithm. What it gives is actually a, a 1 minus w, not w itself. And so what actually ends up happening is that you have the total sums of squares on the bottom, and then you have on the top total minus within and R actually calls in the numerator the between sums of squares. So you can see some similarities to what you've seen before, like a steady to one course, when you talk about like R square measures, or when you talk about other measures in ANOVA that correspond to sums of squares. Um, and so, yeah, so you see some similarities here in terms of terminology and the calculations. Now let me go back to the page, actually I'm going to go back to page... 60. We're actually, we'll go back to page 58. There we go. Okay, page 58. Uh, this corresponded to the output uh, from the um, uh, corresponds to the output with the four observation data set. And we had uh, k equal to 2. In the output, you see something that says between underscore SS, between sums of squares, divided by total underscore SS, total sums of squares, and you get 54.4%. So essentially, the clustering algorithm is accounting for 54% of the total variation in the data. Now, in this case, would, you, would we want this number to be large or small? Large. Okay, so, you know, just be careful. Uh, we want w to be small. We want 1 minus w, which is what this represents then to be large. And again, this would be a number between 0 and 1. Now, what would happen if... Now, remember with this k-means clustering, uh, it is dependent on the, the result that you get in terms of which observations go into which cluster is dependent upon what the initial seeds are. So what if we actually use a different C number before we ran k-means clustering? And in this case, actually what ends up happening is additional initial seeds are chosen. And this is what we get for then the, uh, the cluster memberships, meaning observation 1 goes into cluster 1, observation 2 goes into cluster 2, observation 3 goes into cluster 2, and observation 4 goes into cluster 1. Previously, we had observations 1 and 2 in one cluster, and observations 3 and 4 in another cluster. So then to evaluate, well, did we do better with this different result? This is where we can look at this 1 minus w value, and you get 44.9%. So which, would, which result would you prefer, this new one here or the one that we had previously? The one from previously, because it had a higher 1 minus w. But this shows you, again, that depending upon what the initial seeds are, you get a different result. And that's why it's important to try to implement this algorithm multiple times and then try to and then use the one that gives you the best value.
Okay, so then that takes us then to page 63. Sorry to be jumping around. So now, how do we make the decision if we're looking at k equal 1, k equal 2, k equal 3, k equal 4, and so on? How do we make a decision of which one is the best? Um, and again, what you could do is, you know, you could do, for example, PCA plots, or plots of the principal component scores, and, and look at them for a different uh, set of values of k to see which result makes the most sense. You can look at parallel coordinates plots. You can also look at this, this W measure to help make a decision. And so what you can do is plot the values of W. So what we have here on the y-axis, we have uh, values of W. And they are plotted versus values of K. As I told you, this within sums of squares always decreases as K increases. So we can't necessarily look for the minimal value with respect to the y-axis. Instead, what we do is what we, what's similar to what we did with a scree plot. We look for where do I start seeing a leveling off here in this plot. And you can see this is kind of a judgment call. You know, another person might have a different answer in the end. And sometimes it's difficult to find where does this plot tend to level off. The reason why we're looking for where this levels off is because what this says is that for larger values of k after this leveling off occurs, you're not really getting that much of a benefit from increasing k. So why don't we just, in this case, stop at k equal 4 and choose that as the number of clusters. Again, on the y-axis, instead, you could just equivalently plot just the within sums of squares, too. Okay, so with this tool and also the various plotting tools that we've looked at, again, principal, parallel, parallel coordinate plots, uh, principal uh, uh, component score plots, you can make a judgment. Are there any questions? Now, before we actually apply this, then, to a real data set, uh, let's talk about another topic, and that is, you know, the results from these different cluster seats. As I just mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, our k-means clustering is dependent upon what we use for the initial cluster seeds. The algorithm that we have is trying to essentially minimize this within sums of squares, but it's not a perfect algorithm. It may not get the overall minimum. Um, so because of that, we need to uh, rerun the k-means clustering for the same k uh, with a number of different uh, initial seeds. And there's a few different ways to do that. The first way is essentially what I had just shown you with the four observation uh, data set. And that is simply set a different C before K means, run it a few times, and compare the results. The best result overall you could define as the one that gives you the smallest within sums of squares, or the largest one minus W. Please note that error that's in the notes, please change. I think that was originally increase. It should be decrease. Fortunately, the k-means um, function actually makes it a little bit easier for you, so that typically you're not going to have to implement number one. And instead, in this uh, second way, is that you can use an argument called n start in k-means, and that basically says to R, rerun k-means and start times automatically. So if I say n start equal 10, what R is going to do is essentially run the k-means algorithm 10 different times using 10 ran randomly, sets, ran randomly chosen sets of initial seeds, and then it will return to you the uh, best results, which correspond to the smallest W. It will only return that set of results. Okay, so let's take a look at an implementation then with the goblet data set. Okay. 
So what I decided to do was um, run k means, starting with k equal 1. Obviously, it doesn't make sense to use k equal 1, but it, it obviously it also, too, is a nice place to start uh, for comparative purposes here. Start at k equal 1, go up to k equal 10. Now, why didn't I go larger for my values of k? Well, I only have like 24, 25 observations. You know, probably 10 clusters is too much. If I uh, ended up choosing, let's say, 10 or 15 clusters, I would probably not even use cluster analysis. Um, also, what I'm going to do is use n start equal 10. Now, there's not a set rule on how many, what, what that value should be. You know, obviously, the larger it is, the better. The smaller it is, the worse. Well, you have to make some kind of choice, and I thought 10 successive runs would be uh, good, especially with the fact that, again, I only have 25 observations. Or is it 24? Something like that. Okay. So to implement, then, this process of trying different values of k, what I did was I wrote a for loop. Now, we saw for loops earlier in this cluster analysis set of notes. And basically, what I'm going to do for every k, I'm going to implement this within a for loop and then save the results. So here's my code. The values of k that I'm interested in is 1 to 10. So 1 colon 10, again, gives me integers 1, 2, 3, up to 10. I'm going to save my within sums of squares into an object called save.wss. Um, and, as a way, and as a way to initialize this thing, that I'm, this object, I'm essentially going to create a vector uh, that has, for now, just zeros in it. And the way that I can create that vector, we probably haven't seen before, is just to use, then, uh, the function called numeric. I want to create a vector of numerical values, and I want 10, this vector to have a length of 10. So just to show you real quick, Let me make sure that this data is in R. So save.wss, you can see, has been initialized to die zero. Now, I'm going to set a seed so I can reproduce my results if I need it for some reason. You know, maybe to go back, to, if i got something strange occurring, I can go back and examine better what happened. And then here's the start of my for loop. I say for values of k, could have used a different letter, but it seemed to make sense to use k, in 1 to 10, I want to do the following. The first thing I'm going to do is implement the k-means function, function just like how we've done before. The x argument corresponds to my data. Notice I'm using standardized values. The number of, uh, of clusters corresponds, again, to the center's argument, k. So the first time through the loop, k is equal to 1. So centers is equal to 1. Then I'm going to say n star equal 10 to basically repeat this k-means clustering algorithm 10 times. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm using k-means clustering overall 100 different times. So I'm looking at 10 different values of k, and I have n star equal to 10. Next, what I'm going to do is, and we saw this last time, I'm going to pull my within sums of squares out of the resulting object called clus.means. So that component is called within SS. I'm going to sum it up because basically what this does actually gives you the, the sum for each cluster. And then put the results into my save vector, the kth element of it. So at k equal 1, this runs. At k equal 2, this is going to do it again. k equal 3 is going to do it again, and so on. So that now, here are all my within sum of squares. Any questions about that for loop there? Let's see, it runs pretty quick. Okay, now I want to calculate W. And when I was going over my notes last night, I thought, well, let's uh, calculate the total sums of squares a little bit easier. 
And so what I did was in the notes, I decided to remove that and then replace it simply with plus dot means. I'm going to pull out the total sum of squares from that. So in the very last implementation, when k is equal to 10, I'm going to get the total sum of the squares. It's going to be put into the plus dot means object. And now here I'm just going to pull it out. Remember, the total sum of the squares doesn't change as a function of k. That's why I can do this. I don't think so. I mean, I, I, let me just double check. Obviously, if it did, it would make, make it easier. Let me just double check. Yep, you're right. That makes it a little bit easier. Thank you. I was just trying to make our lives more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? Okay. Um, <clears throat> within my for loop, I sum the values are within the within SS object. And within the SS object, what you have is for each cluster what the within sum of squares is. Um, <clears throat> and so you could either sum the elements up that are within there, or you could just take it. Okay, so I calculate the total sums of squares, <clears throat> or I, I, I get the total sums of squares out, and then simply I create a data frame here, and obviously that is not as well as, uh, constructed as well as it should have been, sorry about that. So this is for k equal 1, 2, 3, down to 10. Here's a simple fix to that. <clears throat> so instead of using k in the data frame, use k.levels. And there's the result. And as you can see, again, as we would expect, uh, this um, this W ascent, which is in the right hand column, um, so it might even even been better to do this. Oops. This W decreases as a function of k. Okay, let's actually look at a graph of that. So I just simply use uh, the plot function as what we've done many times before, so I'm not going to go over the details. And here's a plot. Again, what we're looking for in this plot is where does w start leveling off? And I don't think that this is necessarily uh, a clear-cut case for where you can say that w levels off. I would say, generally speaking, you know, maybe at four clusters, maybe at five clusters, maybe even at six clusters. You know, this is not a perfect, this, this procedure is not always perfect. Um, and, but this is what, you know, based from what I see in this plot, I'm, I'm thinking four or five or six maybe. So then, well, what do you do? You know, because eventually you need to decide one value for the number of clusters that you're going to use. And that's where, uh, you know, again, these plots of the principal component scores uh, and the parallel coordinate plots can be helpful. So let's take a look at some. Please note that the small little change in the notes. So what I decided to do here was, well, let's look at the output if I were to use five clusters. So I set a seed so I can reproduce the results. I use n start equal 10 once more. And I get the output. 
so for example, observation one's in cluster two, observation two's in cluster number five, and so on. And then similar to what we had with the agglomerative clustering methods, I wrote my own function, which you are responsible for understanding how it works and the, the stuff that's inside of it. I wrote my own function called pca.ca.plot2, which now does the principal component plots to allow us to visualize um, these clusters. So I run that with the results. Let me just show you the call to the function. So I simply uh, pass in my data set. I pass in my cluster results from using the k-means uh, algorithm, or the k-means function, and then I just simply put a plot title on it. Let me actually go ahead. Let me run this, because I know I've run this a few times. I want to make sure I'm showing you the right ones, the right results. Let's see here. Okay. Come back over here. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. So with five clusters, this is what we get. So on the left-hand side, uh, principal component number one versus principal component number two. Here are my clusters. Four, five, and 17. 23, observations 23 and 24. Uh, notice here, three, 16, and 18 are now together in one cluster. Then we have this red cluster up here, and we have a blue cluster down there, light blue. So that's what this is saying. If we add also now the, uh, the third principal component by looking at then the, uh, the bubble plot, you can again see something very similar. One thing that kind of concerns me is that notice how in this lower left-hand corner uh, cluster, we see both the blue and the red uh, bubbles being joined together. What that means is that we have some positive and some negative third principal component scores in the same cluster. It's not necessarily anything wrong with it, but again, this is showing that there are some differences amongst the observations. And again, cluster analysis, we're looking for uh, observations that are similar to one another, and we want to group those together. Let's to take a look at some 3D plots. Okay. So we can see here, uh, if you follow my, where my mouse is, here's 23 and 24 in the green. I'm using the same colors that was uh, in this plot over there. Uh, we can also see uh, 4, 5, and 17. That, you know, those make those choices make sense for, for the clusters. Um, let's see now. So we have the, the darker blue here corresponds to 3, 16, 18. And you can see that they are a little bit separated from the other observations. So maybe that does make sense to have a, a separate cluster. It's just my one concern then is that if you take a look at the light blue here, corresponds to what's in the lower left-hand corner. And you can see some light blue now that's down below. And it's kind of almost mixed in with the red. Uh, so it's kind of somewhat questionable, I think, uh, that necessarily that those uh, points should be uh, distinct from one another in, in those uh, clusters. So maybe five clusters is too much. Let's take a look at a parallel coordinate plot. This is on page... Um, 69. I'm using the same colors here as what was in the previous plots. And so if we take a look at the, the black lines, first of all, um, you know, those correspond to sorry, 4, 5, and 17. And again, we see why it makes sense for those observations to be separated from the rest. You know, they have large W4 and W5 values in comparison to the other observations. Um, observations 23 and 24, if you remember, are uh, in the green. And again, there's, you know, distinctions between those observations and the others. They have large W1 and W2 values, just like the black, but now they have lower W4 and W5 values. So that's why they're distinct. That's why they're different. 
But what we also see here is that there's a kind of an overlap between the red and the blue. And again, just to put this in perspective, that corresponds to what we're seeing in the lower left-hand corner here between the red and the, I should say, the light blue. That, you know, maybe it's, it's, it's not as clear-cut that, indeed, that those are separate clusters. Um, and, and we see that, to some respect, in this plot here. You, know, you see a lot of overlap. Like, there are some cases where you know, it looks like maybe the red is higher for W1 and W5. That maybe that's what makes it distinct. Maybe that's what made the algorithm separate those out into separate clusters. Or maybe, you know, instead, five clusters is too much. Indeed, and maybe we should have just had four. make sure I'm covering everything here. So again, in these kinds of situations too, if let's say this is the, if, if you are satisfied with uh, the results from this clustering algorithm, you know, this is where now you would want to try to interpret what these clusters represent. And that's what I have shown on page 70 in the notes. Um, and, I, and I kind of said that in, in, in class here. Uh, but you know, it's always important to try to interpret what the clusters represent in, in the context of the original problems. That's why you're doing the cluster analysis in the first place. It's not just an exercise. Um, on page 69, I actually, uh, I give you a question. Well, how could you plot the cluster means? You know, this is, after all, k-means clustering. How could you plot the cluster means on, let's say, one of these plots here? Well, obviously, you would first need to find the cluster means. How would you find the cluster means? Um, yeah, I think the k-means function, I wasn't thinking of that, but I do think the k-means function gives that information to you. Yeah. So it gives it to you right there, and I would assume yep, the center's argument would give you then the cluster means. Okay, now that you have the cluster means, we need to translate it now essentially to the parallel coordinate system. I'm sorry, not the parallel coordinate system, the principal component system. How would you do that? Yeah, use the predict function to find the principal component scores. And so what you could actually do is visualize where the cluster means in the, in the principal com, uh, component access system that we have here. You can actually visualize it on one of these plots. So on page 70, then, I say, well... You know, as, as, I, I've, as I've already kind of said out loud, you know, I'm not necessarily satisfied with, uh, the, uh, with five clusters. Um, and so it will be good to examine other number of clusters to make a decision of, well, maybe something else is better. And so what I have here said, examine some different number of clusters on your own. I have the code set up in the program already to help you do that. Just for illustrative purposes, let's look at three clusters. Let's see if we think that this is better. Okay, so with three clusters, this is what we get. Four, five, and 17 again are together, but now notice where 18 is. 23 and 24 together as before, but now notice 10 and 12. Uh, 10 and 22 are there. And now we have in the lower left-hand corner all the observations kind of grouped together. So what do you think? Do you think this is better? Well, 
I was dissatisfied with I was dissatisfied more with this. Now we got to be careful here. You know, we you know with goblet data, you know, we said probably two parallel two principal components is probably enough. You know, that third principal component is not really contributing that much information. So perhaps you know, I shouldn't be so critical about the fact that there are some positive and negative third principal principal components that are in the same cluster. Perhaps I shouldn't be that that critical of it, but that's that's where my, my where my problem was. I would have rather seen, you know, maybe something that looked like this. That if we're going to you know divide these up in the lower left hand side, let's divide them up like this. Now, that, again, that's if we are going to divide them up. Now with, oops. Three clusters, we don't have to divide it up. And so in some respect, I'm more satisfied with you know this aspect. I'm not necessarily sure about, you know, let's say 10 and 22 with those guys up there. And maybe, you know, what do we do with 18? But you see us going through this, you can see that there's more than one justifiable answer. There's not one perfect answer. Okay? Remember what where cluster analysis is used. It's used for exploratory data analysis. We are trying to find partitions or groupings of like observations. And in the real in real data sets, what's often going to happen is that there's not going to be a clear cut distinction for some observations. Take a look at. Yeah, let me just give me a second here. Let me actually run it. So here's the 3D plot now with the three clusters. And focus on the black ones. This is 23 and 24 again. Now look at where those other two observations, which were 22 and 10. Look where they appear. You know, they're, you know, they seem to be kind of far apart. And so that's where, again, some of my concern was with respect to 10 and 22. Is it, does it really make sense to put them in there with 23 and 24? Or does it make sense to put it in the green? Well, you can see that there is some distance there, too. Here's then the parallel coordinate plot. Um, and you can see, for example, if you look at W2, focus on the black uh, cluster. This is, here's, here's 23, look at my mouse, here's 24, but now here is, let's see now, let me actually go over here. But here are the, the other two observations that was somewhat questionable. Do we group them with 23 and 24? You can see that there are some differences. And in fact, they are kind of overlapping where the green is. You know, perhaps as a student, you would always like to have clear-cut answers. You know definitely what the correct answer is. And as you can see here, there could be more than one correct answer. You just need to be able to justify your, your results. You know, kind of, you know, went through that. Let's see. Okay. So that concludes then cluster analysis. Any questions? Okay, so to help us see where we are in this course, if you remember the first day of class, I basically broke up the course into
four different overall sections, for the lack of a better name. We had background material. Then we had summarizing data, which maybe perhaps a better name would have been exploratory data analysis. And we have just now finished this section two. Now we're going to go into section three, um, which I call prediction. Um, and what this basically means is this, that uh, what I would like to do is to be able to predict the correct grouping, the correct population, the correct classification for an observation. Let's relate this to the place kicking data set that we saw earlier in the semester. Every, we had about 1,400 and some observations of place kicks that happened during a particular NFL season. And for each observation, we measured a number of different variables, such as distance, uh, was it windy or not, was it pressure or not, uh, and so on. We measured a number of variables. We also measured, well, was the place kick a success or not? So essentially, we have two populations of observations, you could say. Success population, a failure population. Or equivalently, you could say, I have two different groupings for my observation, success or failure, or I have two different classifications for my observation, success or failure. I'm purposely using the different terminology because um, different people will use the different terminology outside this class, so that's why you need to get used to it. And so we want to be able to predict, given a certain distance, Given a certain wind conditions, given a certain pressure conditions, is this place kick going to be a success or is it going to be a failure? That's going to be our ultimate goal in this prediction section. And we're going to look at essentially four different main ways to do this. This is actually an area where there's a lot of research going on uh, and there's many different methods that are being developed out there. Uh, still, uh, we're going to look at some classical methods, and then we're going to also look at some newer methods in our class. Uh, the first set of methods is what's the most classical, I would say, is called, uh, fall under, under the heading of what's called discriminant analysis. Discriminant analysis starts from the perspective of you have multiple populations, like a success population and a failure population. And the, let's say, the variables, such as distance, pressure, um, wind conditions, those variables uh, come from a multivariate normal distribution. So we will have a multivariate normal distribution underlying assumption for discriminant analysis. We will no longer have that distribution assumption for the other three methods that we are going to look at. Even though that there is a multivariate normal distribution assumption, this discriminant analysis is often very robust to non-normality, meaning that it still works pretty good, even if you don't have your assumptions fully satisfied. Uh, to help motivate the problem further and to give us some examples of, of where uh, discriminant analysis is used, Let's take a look at some examples. So again, we have this place being data set. I've already described it to you. Um, but the ultimate goal then with this place kicking data set then would be is, you know, put yourself in the shoes of Bob Colleen. Um, you know, he needs help right now. Um, and, uh, and let's say he's faced with a situation of, should he go for a field goal or not? Well, you know, based upon some discriminant analysis results, he can then determine this place kick, if, or this field goal if I attempt it, is very likely to be a success or is very likely to be a failure. And based upon that, he can make a judgment of what to do. But the key was, in order to make these, this, to do this discriminant analysis, to come up with what's often referred to as discriminant analysis, a classification rule, he needed to collect a sample. And in the sample, he needed to have the variables such as distance, pressure, uh, wind speed, and so on, but he also needed to know, well, what was the end result for that place kick? Was it a success or failure? But the ultimate goal now is then to use then the result that you got from that data set to apply it to a new situation where you don't know what the result will be. And so you can predict it. Okay. Here's another example. 
If you've uh, taken my Static 75 class, you'll be familiar with this data set. This is the weight kernel data set. We're just going to be looking at it in a different way than what we did in our 875 class. This weak kernel data set actually comes from a consulting problem that I worked on a number of years ago. And, uh, a, and the subject matter researcher that I was working with wanted to come up with an automated way to classify uh, weak kernels into three different populations, three different classifications, three different groups. A healthy kernel, meaning everything's good with it. A sprout kernel, which basically means, okay, see, see that sprouted? Or a scab kernel, which basically means is that the kernel has some kind of um, fungus or disease um, visible, let's say, on it. Ideally, healthy kernels are the best, and you want to have only healthy kernels. Sprout and scab kernels are not as desirable. They will have lower, uh, let's say, qualities to them when people process them this, these kernels in, to make flour. And so it would be nice if one could have some kind of automated process that says, okay, this is a healthy kernel, this is a sprout kernel, this is a, sca this is a scab kernel. And perhaps, you know, let's say pay a farmer a certain amount of money depending upon how many are healthy, how many sprout, how many are scab. And so to develop this automated method, the researcher developed a way to automatically determine what the density of the kernel is, the hardness of the kernel, the size, the weight, and the moisture content of the kernel. And so he took a sample of about 275 kernels, I believe, put it into this automated system to come up with this information. Also, what the researcher did was he had, let's say, some experts in the field actually physically look at each of those corresponding kernels and determine, is it truly a healthy one? Is it truly a sprout one? Is it truly a scab? So we know what the correct classification is. What we would like to do now with the scrim analysis, and this is what I actually did with the researcher, was based upon just these measurements here, could I correctly classify, could I correctly find the, the populations for these kernels based upon those measurements and using this technique called the discriminant analysis. And so you can see an overall then measurement of how good discriminant analysis or any of these other methods that we're going to talk about in this section does, how good it does, or yeah, it does, um, will be the correct classification percentage. The higher this percentage is, the better the method is. And when we have, as you saw, four different methods that we're going to be looking at of how to determine populations, how to determine classifications, you can see the overall best one is going to be the one that gives you the highest percentage of correct classifications. And as you might expect, since we're talking about four different methods, not one method always works best in all situations. Let's take a look at one more example. This also comes from an actual problem that I worked on. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I spent a summer out at the Idaho National Laboratory. At the time, it was called Idaho National um, Engineering and Environmental Laboratory. They dropped the E's. And now it's just the Idaho uh, National Laboratory. It's the Department of Energy Laboratory. And the ultimate goal of the project that I, main project I worked on um, out there uh, in Idaho Falls, Idaho, uh, was we wanted to determine uh, what was the contents of an unexploded artillery shell. So you can imagine a, bat, uh, a battlefield situation. You have maybe some unexploded artillery shells laying on the battlefield. Obviously, you want to be careful about, with them, and you want to determine what's inside of them. Are they it's empty? Or maybe there's mustard gas in them. Or maybe some other, obviously, non-desirable thing inside of them. Um, and so we wanted to develop ways to determine what was inside it. This was an Army-sponsored uh, project. And uh, my, my mentor, Larry Blackwood, and uh, an engineer, unfortunately I can't remember his first name, Rodriguez, um, uh, they uh, put together, uh, they developed some methods to, to do this. Um, but then when I was there, they wanted to develop some better methods, basically methods that were not... Um, let's say, contact the artillery shell uh, when it's trying to take some kind of measurements to determine what's inside of it. 
obviously you probably don't want to touch the artillery shell. Okay, that might cause explosion. Uh, so we wanted to come up with non-contact methods to determine what's inside an artillery shell. Um, and basically what, 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 we, what we did, and actually I was involved with the data collection too, which is unusual for a statistician, uh, we basically were bouncing sound waves off of it. And based upon the acoustic spectrum that we got back, that helped us determine what was inside. But since this was a, uh, the beginning of this research project, of this non-contacting way of determining what's inside the artillery shell, we didn't actually use artillery shells. Instead, we actually used something else as kind of a proxy to see if we could get to work with this, this easier thing first. And if we work for that easier thing, then we're going to try to with the harder thing, these artillery shells. So I, I actually have um, an object that we collected data on. I was able to keep it as a souvenir. So lucky. Um, <laughs> and so I spent then my whole summer trying to determine what's inside a Sunny D juice container. Well, juice, perhaps. But we also pour the juice out of some Sunny D juice containers. And we put water inside. We left some that were empty. And we left some, and we actually uh, put sand in some of them. And so you can imagine, you know, the, the acoustic spectrum when you're, let's say, um, focusing some sound waves on it are going to probably be different for sand versus if it was empty. Um, so that's what I spent my summer on. Um, and I will, I will uh, give you some more information about what happened as we go along in this section. So you can see that, you know, these discriminant analysis methods and just methods overall that are trying to predict a classification, try to predict a population, are quite important, and they're very um, used a lot. Uh, please note that these small clarifications are in the notes. Um, so what discriminant analysis does is something similar to what normal linear regression does. You have some explanatory variables or independent variables, and you're trying to predict a, uh, a response. In normal linear regression, our response, let's call it y, has a normal distribution to it. It's a continuous value. Here, instead, our, essentially our response corresponds to our population or our group. And obviously, it's then categorical in nature. You know, success or failure, for example, with the place kicking data set. So because of that, then we have to use other statistical methods. We can't just use normal linear regression. This area of prediction for groups, prediction of populations, is, is huge. Um, and again, one could teach a whole course on it. Uh, to give you an idea of just how big it is, take a look at the multivariate and the machine learning uh, uh, CRAN task views on the R website, and you'll see all the packages that have been developed just so far uh, to do this kind of stuff. Okay, so now let's talk about then the details of what discriminant analysis does. We're going to start off with the simplest case possible. We have two populations, and we're also going to make some additional assumptions coming up, and then we'll, we'll generalize as we go along. So let's suppose that we have two multivariate normal populations. And just to make things easier, I think it's easier, we're going to say population 1 is simply denoted by the Greek letter pi 1, uppercase pi. Population 2 is denoted by pi 2. So pi 1 has a multivariate normal distribution, p variant, meaning p variables to it. It has a, a mean, mu 1. It has a covariance matrix sigma 1. Population 2, then, multivariate normal, mean 2, sigma 2. And let's say we are concerned about x, which represents a particular item that we have. And it, it's p variant, p by 1. And using then this information that we have about this item in X, we're going to try to classify it to population one or population number two. Hopefully correctly classify or correctly predict its population. We're going to look at four different ways to do this, and they all have equivalencies to them. So you might be thinking, well, why, am I, why don't I just focus on one instead of talking about four? 
The reason why I'm doing four is because sometimes you'll hear one person do one way. Sometimes you'll hear another per person talk about it a different way. Sometimes you'll have another person talk about it another way. And since this is just kind of a, uh, due to the nature of our class, that's why I need to talk about all four so that you're prepared to deal with them outside of this class. Okay, so the first one is what's called the likelihood rule. And simply what this does is it evaluates the likelihood function for both populations at x. So here's my multivariate normal distribution. And notice how I have x in there. Now we talked about likelihood functions and maximum likelihood estimation for the factor analysis section. And what we talked about is that the larger this likelihood function is, the more plausible, let's say, a set of parameters are, given your data. Well, essentially, my data is x here. So in order to decide, well, which population does x belong to, population 1 or 2, simply evaluate the likelihood functions. If the likelihood function for population 1 is larger at x than it is for population 2, classify x into population 1. Otherwise, population 2. Seems rather simple. It is. Now we're going to talk about the second way to do this. This is often referred to as the linear discriminant rule. And we're going to make one simplification. Suppose you have equal covariance matrices. We'll look at later how you can get around that. But let's suppose that we have equal covariance matrices. If we go back to the Likert rule, you notice some simplifications then. If sigma 1 was equal to sigma 2, notice the stuff outside, outside of E would be essentially the same. So you could throw that out. Obviously, we both, we, in both cases, we had that E there. Well, you could throw that away. And the only thing that's going to be then different between the two likelihood functions, if sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2, will be the stuff that you see inside of here. So you can, you can play around with it, do some math, and find out then that the likelihood rule then simplifies down to just this. Choose population 1, which will then correspond to the, max, the, the maximal likelihood function, choose population 1 if a vector b, which is sigma inverse times mu1 minus mu2, times your x, subtract off k, which is another constant based upon your mu's and your sigma. If b prime x minus k is greater than 0, choose population 1. Otherwise, choose population 2. And again, this is just a simplification of the likelihood rule because the covariance matrices are equal. You can go through the math and see that. So that's rule number, let's say, uh, classification rule number one, or two, I should say. Rule number three, or the third way to go about doing this, is what's called the Mahalanobis distance rule. Mahalanobis is a famous statistician, Indian statistician, and please make this, uh, just wanted to make sure it was clear, suppose again sigma 1 was equal to sigma 2. Then the likelihood rule, and also then the linear discriminant rule, is equivalent to looking at the problem in this, in this way. Let's calculate a distance. A distance that x is to the corresponding population, population 1 or population 2. Now we talked about dis how to calculate distances between two vectors in the cluster analysis section. If you remember Euclidean distance was simply, let's say I have two vectors x1 and x2. This was Euclidean distance. Instead, what we're going to use is what's called Mahalanobis distance. And you can see some similarities to it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm calculating what's the distance that x is to the center, essentially, of a population. Population 1 or population 2. 
So x minus mu i. But uh, I am also going to take into account the variability in the data. And so that's why you have a sigma inverse in there. What does this simplify down to if p was equal to 1? I mean, I only had one variable. You're going to have something in the numerator, you're going to have something in the denominator. What goes in the numerator? Well, think about that. So we have this distance, and so you might think then, well, the smallest distance that x is to one of these populations then corresponds to which population I should classify x into. So if I have two distances, let's call it d1, the distance that x is to population 1, d2, the distance that x is to population 2, if d1 is less than d2, well, then classify x into population 1, otherwise population 2, and that's how it works. It's just, again, a little bit of a different way to think about this, but it's still all equivalent, mathematically equivalent. And so this is just kind of a graph showing what we would do. That, uh, you know, if, if I have two variables, x1 and x2, and let's say the variances are the same between these two variables, uh, the, the ellipses there that you see are contours, the same contours for the two multivariate normal distributions. And if I want to classify x sub 0, instead of x, just call x sub 0, if I want to classify x sub 0 into one of these populations, I just simply look at, well, which center is x sub 0 closest to? It's closest to the center, of course, by population 1. So I classify it there. Then building upon, then, the Mahalanobis distance rule, we have another equivalent way to do this. This is uh, called a posterior probability rule. You know, you might be thinking, well, it would be nice if I could somehow say the probability that X should be in population 1 is 0.9, the, population, the probability that X is in population number 2, or should be in population number 2, is, let's say, 0.1. Well, since population 1 had a higher probability, okay, classify it in population 1. That's what this posterior probability rule essentially does. Again, suppose that the uh, covariance matrices are equal. And then here's the probability calculation. The probability that, you, that X belongs to population, sub, uh, population I is E to the negative one-half D sub I divided by then E to the negative one-half uh, D1 plus E to the negative one-half D2. Is the numerator, can the numerator ever be larger than the denominator? No. Obviously, you see the numerator is a subset of the denominator. So we get a value between 0 and 1, and we can essentially interpret it as a probability. In the end, though, it's not truly a probability because you know, probabilities are associated with random variables, a random event. We don't necessarily have, have a random event here. Either the observation is from population 1 or it's from population 2. Either or. We don't necessarily have a random event uh, for that. But we can interpret it as a probability. So again, if, let's say, the probability of population 1 is greater than the probability for population 2, we'll classify the observation to population 1. If not, do population 2. And the nice thing, and the reason why people like these posterior probabilities is because you know, it kind of gives you a measure of uh, you know, how sure you are about the classification. You know, if you had probability of 0.51 for population 1, probability of 0.49 for population 2, obviously it shows that you have some uncertainty involved with that particular observation of which population should go into. But if you have 0.99 versus 0.01, well, now you have a lot more certainty. Okay, so so far what I've been doing is using mu sub i and sigma sub i. These, are, these contain parameters, and obviously... In a real-life situation, you're not going to know what those are, so you're going to need to estimate them. 
Well, we can estimate them using the same methods that we learned about in the data distributions and correlation section. Estimate them and then use those four different methods or those four different rules in the same way as I just described to you, but now using estimated quantities. When sigma 1 is equal to sigma 2, though, well, how do we estimate then one overall covariance matrix? Well, what's usually done is a pooled estimates form. In your first stat course, we talked about hypothesis tests for the difference of two means. And you learn about a pooled variance as a way to try to do the test. Hopefully that sounds familiar. Well, essentially, we now, to come up with a pooled estimate of the covariance matrix, we just extend this same concept to a covariance matrix format, where we are pulling uh, sigma hat 1 and sigma hat 2. We're essentially, in this pool, we are weighting them by you know, the, the number of observations that one has. Okay, so page 8. As I mentioned earlier, a way to determine, well, what is the best classification method? What is the best prediction method that we're going to use with a particular data set? In order to make that determination, you're going to be very, very focused on what is the um, overall uh, correct classification percentage. You know, am I correctly classifying these observations into their corresponding populations 90% of the time? Or maybe just 70% of the time? Maybe just 50% of the time? Which is going to give you the highest correct classification percentage? Or equivalently, which is going to give you the lowest incorrect classification percentage? That's what we're going to be very, very focused on uh, now for the rest of the, essentially the rest of the semester, is calculating these, uh, these rates, these percentages. Um, and also that reminds me of one thing that I, I, I kind of uh, failed to mention, and that is when, when we do these methods where we're trying to classify observations into the correct populations, um, unlike what you've learned in, let's say, in a regression setting, let me find that in the corresponding notes, it, there's going to be, for us, much less emphasis on interpreting the effect of an in, in independent variable. So I might, for example, not really be, I might not really care about, well, what is a quantification of the effect of distance on whether or not a plastic is a success or failure? Whether all I'm interested in is I want to get it right. I want to get the, that, that classification correct. So this is one additional difference between, let's say, regression analysis, where you're often interested in, let's say, interpreting the slope coefficient, your beta hats, versus what we're doing here. So, sorry to digress there a little bit. Okay, so, well, what can happen is, is that uh, some noise could be put in there, and also in which then might, uh, it can at least a little bit um, lower your uh, correct classification percentage. It could. It doesn't always. But also, you know, from the standpoint of uh, if you don't need a variable, why waste your time and collect information on it? But there will be a, a lot less emphasis, too, on variable selection for what you were basically thinking. A lot less emphasis. Okay, so how can we estimate, then, the correct classification rate, or the incorrect classification rate, too? There's going to be four different ways. The most ideal way to do it is to go out and collect some new data. So, for example, with the plant seeking data set, you know, I had data from the 1995 season. Well, in order to check how good it works, this, this method that I can develop based upon this data, how about then I go out and collect data now in the 1996 season? Now, for the 1995 season, it took me 40 hours of entering in the data. Do I really want to spend 40 hours of entering in the data again for the 1996 season? Well, I'm not a graduate student anymore, so no. Uh, but, uh, you know, you, you know I, I make fun of that, but you can see the problem then with collecting new data is that, you know, it could be costly, it could be time-consuming. 
And so while this is the best way to evaluate how a particular method is going to do, is often the most impractical way. So something very similar then is to use what's called a holdout data set. Now if you've had, for example, a full-fledged regression course, you've heard of, let's say, model building and validation data sets, or equivalently some people will call them training data sets versus calibration data sets or test data sets. Essentially what estimates from a holdout data mean is this. Um, and actually I did do this with my play scheme data set. You're going to see this shortly. I actually collected data on about 1,800 observations, 1,800 play skits. And before I even touched the data to examine, you know, various classification methods, I put aside 400 observations. And then what you've seen so far are the 1,400 observations that I actually built models upon. I build the models on those 1,400 observations, see how it works with that, and then I try it out, try this model out on these 400 observations that I kind of set aside. So these 400 observations are kind of serving the role, role as collecting new data. I didn't actually collect new data, but it's kind of serving that same role. So I'm going to try my methods out on that and, correct, and calculate how, how well does it classify. Do I get 90% correct classification? Do I get 80%? How well? So what's the problem with this method? Well, obviously, now you're not building your statistical method upon as much data as you could. And so you might think that if I'm building a model based upon 1,400 observations versus 1,800, I might not do as well. But fortunately, 1,400 is a, you know, a pretty sizable number, so I wasn't really worried about that. But let's say instead you're left with a situation, this is what I actually had when I was out in Idaho, you know, it was a time-consuming process to collect this data. And so I basically might have a data set of size 40. Well, do I put, find my model based upon 30 observations and then put 10 aside? No. Well, now you're not, you know, you're, you're really, you know, removing a lot of your data. You don't really have much data to begin with. You know, that, that's often a question then, or a problem that uh, someone faces. Also, something else to, to, uh, uh, to, to think about here is, if I were to apply a, a, a particular statistical method, such as discriminant analysis, to these 1,400 observations, will it do as well in terms of the correct classification rates? Do you think it will do as well with these 1,400 observations as it would with these 400 observations that could decide? Do you think they would do equally as well, or do you think it would do better in one or the other? Exactly. If you build a statistical model, or if you come up with a statistical method on some data, you're trying to find the best method for that data. And typically, not always, but typically, that method's going to work best then on that data versus if you were to go out and collect a new data set or if you were to have a holdout data set because it wasn't built upon that extra data. But that's why it's so important to have a holdout data set or to have go out and collect new data so that you can get, let's say, I'm going to use a statistical term here, an unbiased estimate of the correct classification rate by just applying to your data itself that you built your model or you built your statistical method upon, you are likely to have a bias estimate. Bias down, in ter I'm sorry, bias up in terms of the correct classification rate. Okay, we are out of time. Are there any questions? Okay, that's it for today. <laughs>